of Hungarian's involved areas of printmaking. Uh, he's currently an adjunct professor and graduate mentor at Columbia University in NYU, NY, uh, New York City. His uh, presentation is Direct Reviewer, a Creative Variant, Materials, Research, and Art. <laughs>
in the finished print, I guess. Um, just a quick thing, who am I? Uh, I've been teaching photogravure since the early 80s, um, starting in Europe, mainly in Belgium, at the uh, Royal Academy, um, at the Hoger Institute, in Antwerp, at Brandt Mandrell Center in Castle, Belgium. Um, I've taught a uh, dedicated photographer class for nine years straight at Columbia University. Because I think it's pretty, pretty important to keep these processes going for, you know, for the future of, uh, of our, our art. I, Started at Universal Limited Art Assistance, which I'll probably refer to as ULAE from now on, around 78. And um, these are some of the artists I worked with. I was there for 25 years. And um, I'm mainly an etcher, but I love photo mechanical work. So um, immediately started working, you know, figuring out and working with photography. And one of the persons I used photographer with a lot at ULBE was Kiki Smith. Um, and I'm just gonna show you some of these quickly here. We photographed her uh, with infrared film. Um, so you're getting a photographer of just the heat, uh, red filters, negatives, typical photographers. And these are all of Kiki. She used, to use, she used herself as a subject mainly at uh, Universal. And uh, ending up with uh, My Blue Lake, which we went to the British Museum and used a periphery camera, um, which was uh, pretty fascinating. Um, this is a shot of Kiki and I uh, in 2016 at Yale Art Gallery where we give a talk on the print. Uh, but the person I used to photograph with the most and who eventually read, led to me figuring out, direct reviewer, that it was a thing with Robert Alfenberg. Um, this is a photo reviewer, Chuck Close of Robert Alfenberg. And these are some of the early prints from 83, 84, 85. These are Alfenberg photo reviewers. They were single ups. Uh, one of the biggest ones that would jump to 88 was the Soviet American Array, which was done for Robert Alfenberg. Overseas Cultural Exchange, Rocky. These are massive photogravures comprised of many plates printed in different colors from each other. To give you kind of an idea of the size of the print, you can see two of them hanging on the wall at the studio. Uh, street sounds, let's figure out something new in the mid 90s. Let's do four color photogravure where Red, yellow, blue, black, four plates for each image is used. And we made a few, quite a few of these. Uh, but I'll give you an idea of the size there. And again, it's four color, but it's not half tone, it's, it's full tone. And this is the 90s. We didn't have computers um, to separate them. Well, actually, we did have computers. <laughs> <laughs> And we had to write a lot of information down and do a lot of things. So. Ground rules series, uh, going down the captivium and working with Bob in the dark room where we prepared plexiglass plates with photo emulsion, black and white photo emulsion. And uh, Robert Rothenberg painted the developer onto the plates to get his hand into the, into the photograph. So you can really see, you know, painting, painting these photos up. And the plexi plates were then used as the positives for the photo, the actual photographer plates, and then colored with chosen and plates printed on top of each other. And the last series I did with Robert before leaving ULAE was Ruminations, where at this point he had his own iris printer and he was transferring water soluble iris prints onto paper with water. And we would photograph those on a copy camera and then make positive films for them. But let's jump back to the Bellini series, which led to direct review. Um, these are some pretty big photographers. You can see them here. There's five of them. And 
And at the time, we had to figure out a way for Bob to paint onto the plexiglass, uh, paint onto the print, but yet work with the, the layout, the mock-up wood. So we laid plexiglass on top of them and made a um, caustic solution of deadly chemicals that would etch into it. And he proceeded to paint on top of it the prints themselves with these plexiglass plates, which we wholly intended to then wipe with ink and print onto the prints. It didn't work. But our saving grace was I had mixed, we had mixed black pigment into the caustic solution. And we wound up using these plexiglass plates as positives to make photogravure plates with. And that was really the first time that we started to uh, to do direct review. Other artists support right on here, we have Terry Winters, the larger images are uh, all the hand direct reviewers, the smaller ones are photo reviewers. Susan <coughs> Rallenberg, Lisa Yuskavich, Elizabeth Murray, Julia Lethbridge, Jim Dine, Jim Roy and of course Jasper Johns. The green background is a a dressing film where he did a neat wash, and the rest of it is uh, an etching. And in this one, Jasper and Floyd, both photo reviewer of the family photo that you see in the upper right, and ink wash, uh, besides regular etching. In 2002, I switched over to Two Palms in New York City after almost 25 years of Ubal AD. Uh, working with a lot of the same artists, <laughs> but um, a lot of new ones too, and a lot of new ideas. Uh, we still did photo reviewers, traditional photo reviewers there, only we didn't have a photographic lab to produce films and things, so we entered the digital age using film recorders, uh, Dirt's Lambda, plotters, um, and even, you know, at this point, Epson printers. So these are some Chuck Close, you know, straight up photo reviewers that are made in two palms. Ellen Gallagher, photo reviewer, made with a large Dirt's Lambda uh, seat print. And to this day, this is about six months ago, it's a Dina Lawson print. You can see the uh, yellow assembly in there and uh, the size of it type of thing. Um, I started to work with Elizabeth Payton and trying to give her something that she could work in her painterly language with in etching. And we, she works live from sitters. She paints them, they come into the studio. It's very, very um, academic. And she had no trouble painting on drafting films with uh, ink wash. And here you see her painting a sitter, Nick, and she said, can I do multiple colors? Yes, yeah, sure, when they dry, let's lay them on top of each other and we'll make multiple plates. And here you have a five plate print with maybe about seven colors, <coughs> the result of that. And then she really took off with that. Um, you can see her here uh, painting Mark Jacobs on the left and um, Cecily Brown hanging out on the right. There's a print from one of those sessions with Mark, printed on silk paper. Uh, she wanted to know, can I go back into the plate and retouch it? I'm not happy with his shirt. Yes, you can. If you look closely at his shirt, you might see some markings where it's scraped and spit by. Um, she also works from uh, existing photographs. It's one of the steelets of Georgia O'Keeffe. And at this point, she was starting to use oil paint, which we had to let dry a little longer, and, uh, but the results were pretty much the same after, after maple fall. That's uh, one of her oil paintings on drafting film. That's the direct reviewer of it. Hardly any retouching in that. Another one, direct reviewer in color. And lately, run on the press with the actual painting stamping up. Uh, Cecily Brown, she could do it right away also. Um, this is a six or seven color piece made with four plates. 
Um, and then she went back in uh, roulette work, things like that. Uh, here are some new ones. These are the gelatin stencils after they've been developed on copper plates waiting to be etched. Um, and that's a representation of the one. And I think you'd be hard pressed to find where her soft ground work was later. It's in there. Carol Dunn, again, making one of, one of the nicest uh, representations of a director of your, I think. You can really see the brush work on this box. Ellen Gallagher, her deluxe series, incredible work. Uh, photographer and director of your and every other print method you can think of. So, uh, here you see the photograph of your lettering and magazine parts and all for a director of your to see creatures like these jellyfish. And here, so screen lights, so green background, a plasticine wig, but the director of your collar and face. Um, I counted these products work the best, three mil graphics, drafting film, Kohenori, and Oxbow that you could competing. And the person that really took the best example of this was Crystal Philly. And he really just painted these incredible pieces on this series called Black Kiss. And they needed hardly any retouching whatsoever. So these are the uh, paintings, and they were the prints. And it's a portfolio of 10 prints. It really came out well. And it really shows how well those aspects work of that ink and that film. Peter Doig using the ink, using the film, uh, going back into the play of work with them. Matthew Ritchie. Stanley Whitney. That's a gelatin stencil on a blade of one of his pieces. In black and blue, the finished print. He did 10 of them in different shapes, different colors. Uh, another method, quickly, Xerox toner suspended in alcohol. You can go over this and keep changing it until you're happy with it. And when you're happy with it, we melt it either by fumes of solvents or light heat. This is Dana Schutz painting with Xerox toner. Developing the plate with hot water. The plate and the edge, uh, excuse me, the edge plate and the mylar. The graphics film and the plate and the finished print. I made a series of, uh, I mean, just show you some of the different uh, reticulations and what have you, and some of the erased parts. I made a series of 10 of those. And finally, Mel Bachner. Uh, he really loves working with Xerox Toner because he works with words and he likes to erase words, <coughs> thinking of them as thoughts. <coughs> um, and this is a great example. He painted a background and then dry brushed the words. Uh, a whole series he's been doing called these aspirations, all with Xerox Toner. The plate, draining it. Uh, the addition, and I'm just going to show you a bunch of these here. That's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it could be worse. Is this it? Mel also works with um, ink wash, and you can see with these small blah blah blahs. Or you ink wash one film, ink wash another film, you print in some colors, and then. <laughs> Rubber stamps, we do them on the laser, dip them in the uh, Kohenor ink onto the stamping, things like that. Um, you know, letting the ink run down the wall with the rubber stamp and using that as the director of your film. So, um, in the words of Mel, uh, that's all. Some of the Russian fairies that were doing multiple plates, 
Do you do you line them all up and print one print, or do you run it through more than once? Um, if how do I put this? If the plates are overlapping, like, no, like you had something that was like a red one here, blue one here, green one right. here. Right. If you can do that, red, blue, and what? What we're on that is one, right? But a lot of times there's a red plate over a green one, so you have to. Those have to be two separate ones. Um, and even go off work with plate marks. So if the image was so big or something, he would say, you know what? I want blank plate out to here. I want to see that embossment filling up that one. <laughs> that, was, that was also an element that, that he had to take into consideration. Hi. Hi. Um, I have kind of a clarifying question. Thank you for your talk. It was great. Um, so my understanding is the main difference, or only difference, between direct gravure and photogravure is that the uh, image source is not photographic. Is that right? Mm. So, <laughs> so my question, I don't know if this might be for everybody or just a nomenclature thing. Um, I spend a lot of time talking about lithography, and photolithography, I explain to people, is in the plate exposure process, not necessarily the image source. Right. So, um, why do you think that, in this case, direct gravure and photogravure, it differentiates the image source as opposed to lithography, which doesn't, you know? Um, I mean, other than the processes themselves, I, I don't know. I mean, um, I don't really have a good answer for that. They're, they're two different animals, two different species of the same genera. The thing I might have touched on it was that it gave a lot of the artists who work with the painters, they're draftsmen or even sculptors, but it gives them a pretty well jumping off point where they're close to the finish line before they even touch the plate. Um, and I think etching lends itself a little bit more to that Italian work than maybe working with photo lithos. I know Elizabeth has started with photolithos on film. She has drawn on film and made photolithos with Maurice Sanderson. And so she kind of was the one that brought it up to me. And I was like, yeah, we can do that. You don't have to do that. <coughs> but we always try to, you know, like, let's, you know, once you have this down, let's try to get a little, little bit more work into it, you know, make it a little more special. So those crystal feelings were possibly one of the only groups that were not touched. They were so perfect. I, I don't know if I answered your question. Yes. It's amazing to see how many different artists you them realize their vision through this medium, what was your most important thing that you did to help them with something that was new to them? Um, I mean, we, there's a lot of collusion going on. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, so <laughs> There's a lot of, um, I mean, you know, you'll hear the word collaboration a lot and stuff like that. Um, that happens and we do it. Um, you know, it depends on what that artist, what their goal is, where they're going, what the finished product is. And um, we tend to want to be able to facilitate a way to reach it um, in the least painless way. We'll put it that way. I mean, after 50 years of doing this, that's the way I like to look at it. So, um, I'll suggest to somebody, wow, um, you know, did you ever think about painting on some something trans
resolution, you could make an offer to them for that. So. Other people I wouldn't recommend it to, I would you know, hand them a, a smoked etching plate with a needle. It really depends on, on the goal of the artist and what they're after. I, I think that's what you meant. Uh, hi, Craig. Ray down front here. Um, yeah. <laughs> so working on the film. I'm in line now. <laughs> Sorry. <Yeah. laughs> working on the film is just such a specific uh, thing that they're making that you need to make the play. And I'm wondering if any of these artists that have worked a long time, you know, like Elizabeth or Cecily, have they expressed that this thing that they've developed with you, that they've, they've taken it back to their studio practice, being like their paintings or watercolors, and how like what you do has affected what they do outside of the studio? I think so. I, I do. Um, especially with somebody, um, somebody like Cecily, will um, she'll really experiment um, with with the mylars and stuff. In fact, you know, it can, it can get out of control. <laughs> Um, meaning, um, here's an artist, and they'll generate, uh, you know, 15 pieces of film that they painted, and they're like, let's make these all etchings, and I'll pick which one I'll work on. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so um, that that can happen. With somebody with Elizabeth, like Elizabeth, she'll, uh, Elizabeth will stand and work for sometimes two days on a painting in the Two Palm Studio. So, but, and if she has a sitter, she, she's concentrating on the sitter. So she's concentrating on that painting. Um, she doesn't really do things, you know, at her studio or something like that. So somebody like Peter Joy will um, maybe make a couple of marks on the mylar and we'll, we'll, we'll make a plate. And by the time it's done, those marks are long gone. You know, it's just like a, like a ladder type of thing. So, so yeah, he's brought them home. But I think the, I think Cecily is, is the, um, uh, you said the user. Thank you so much um, for that presentation. As a, from your position um, and experience of working um, in the process, helping others with the process, working with artists, um, as you've heard historians talk about the dynamic that we can't see, uh, that passes, uh, that, that gets lost uh, in distance. What is your advice to us for how to think about um, questions or understand prints when we don't necessarily know the dynamic and the relationship between the uh, printer and the image originator? Come to the studio. <laughs> No, really, and I think curators, um, you know, people in museums, people involved in printmaking, come into the studio, um, you know, force your way in. <laughs> um, uh, Two Palms is an open studio. You know, give us a call and, and make an appointment and come see what we do. And um, I think that, that that's really a helpful, uh, that's a helpful, thing for understanding how this dynamic works. I mean, there is a, almost all the artists you saw up here, they want to be in the studio. They want a bunch of people around. There's a, a, so many of them are on their own in, in their own studio, painting, sculpting, whatever they're doing. They, they want this, this type of, um, they want somebody walking by and going like, you know, like, wow, that looks great. So, um, which happens, and you know, it's an old story. Uh, at um, ULAE in the late seventies, there was uh, the early seventies. There was we, uh, we had a French chef, Mrs. Jones, and um, Jennifer was just finishing uh, pork and mirror, which was uh, this beautiful lithograph, and Mrs. Jones had been walking by. She goes, Mr. Jones, these are beautiful works. <laughs> and he said, thank you. And about six months later, when he signed the edition, she signed one for her. Oh. You never know, so. <laughs> <laughs> so.